good. We've been talking about leadership as the conference began last night. Leadership with integrity. This morning, John Perkins talked about the importance of leadership with character and leadership with vision. Um, last night, particularly the choir, the, the Friendly Temple Choir, wasn't that a wonderful way to begin the whole time? Really began to lift the beat and lift the tempo. Um, I'm just very grateful, and I just want to start by saluting John Perkins. We, we got acquainted back in the early 80s when John and Vera May were living in Jackson, Mississippi, and I was on his uh, board for his international house, and I used to have the pleasure of flying to Mississippi every hot August to get together and do some planning, and it was back when H. Spees was still a kid, and great things were happening in Jackson. I tried to talk John out of going to California. I was obviously dead wrong, uh, uh, but God has been blessing his ministry every place he goes and the message and the man have been a challenge to all of us. You should know that in Mississippi, he is currently working with black legislators, white legislators, and working for a whole program of reconciliation in the state that he comes from. So can we just give John an expression of our appreciation? I grew, up in, I grew up in San Francisco as a kid. I had the run of the city from the time I was six. Uh, was not raised in a Christian home. Was hanging out with a group of aspiring young uh, delinquents and when we were adolescents. Uh, to be honest, I wasn't any good at school. I was too small to do sports and we weren't any, even any good at delinquency. Uh, and it was, you know you're in trouble when nothing works. And it was out of that context as a 16 year old that I was converted at a missions conference in Southern California, called into mission all at the same time, found a Christian college that didn't have any standards at all. They'd take anybody. My grades were so bad, they took me anyway. Uh, graduated in my earliest years, were working in urban ministry. I worked as a social worker. I started an urban ministry program out of the college. I graduated from Cascade College. Dixie and Lowell Noble are here that used to work in, in that college. Good things used to happen. Uh, and I, I've worked in Haiti for seven years with World Concern, working in a project among the poor there. But most of what Christine and I do now is trying to work with folks like you to get ready for the challenges of a new millennium, to find new creative ways to do ministry in church and particularly in urban ministry, uh, addressing the urgent needs of the poor. We're going to be talking in our time today about living at threshold time. We're not only living at the threshold of the last decade of the 20th century and the third millennium since the coming of Christ, we're living in the threshold of a world changing at absolutely blinding speed. My concern is there's virtually nothing going on in the church to try to assess the change that's coming at us or how those of us concerned for ministry need to engage it. So we want to take you on some trips back to the future this morning to try to get after that and think about how we need to reinvent our lives, how we do parenting, youth ministries, urban ministries, and how we do the church as we move into a world changing at blinding speed. So what I'm titling the two presentations today and tomorrow is CCDA 2008, Leading Leaders Creating New Possibilities for Life and Mission for a New Millennium. Three things we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about leading with foresight. We need people who lead and start to pay attention to change. We're going to follow up on what John was talking about this morning, leading with vision. We need to go back to the Bible and find an alternative to the dreams and aspirations of American culture, not just for our spiritual life, but all of life. And then we're going to talk about leading with creativity. Wayne mentioned this morning about creativity. Christine and I do creativity workshops with people in urban ministry, churches, to help people create the new models that we're going to need for a new millennium. Just a story to get us started. Uh, John Perkins has had the opportunity, as we have, to work with Aboriginal Christian leaders in, in Sydney, Australia, where Christine is from. Four years ago, Christine and I were there working with Aboriginal Christian leaders, great people doing some wonderful ministries, urban ministries, working on some of the reserves. When they conference, they don't conference day and night like we do. They conference in the daytime and they party and tell stories at night. I think they have a better idea. So they get together and kind of enjoy each other in the evening. We were together one evening just kind of partying and telling stories and this Aboriginal pastor comes up to me, he says, Tom, he says, do you realize we wouldn't have this mess we've got in the world today if we aboriginals had been the ones in the Garden of Eden instead of you guys. I said, what are you talking about? He said, if we aboriginals had been the ones in the Garden of Eden instead of you guys, we would have thrown away the fruit, eaten the 
snake and we wouldn't have any of this mess we've got in the world today. A little different perspective. To get ready for the third millennium, sisters and brothers, we're going to need a different perspective. We're going to need to think of, we're going to need to approach the future in some new ways and we're going to need to lead, learn to lead with foresight. This morning we're going to talk about leading with foresight, tomorrow with vision and creativity. Tomorrow we're going to get into the biblical material, but today we want to try to sketch out some of the changes that are coming at us. Often when I work with groups, what I'll do in terms of trying to challenge people to lead with foresight is I will take them back and have them list all the changes, the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And we'll talk about the civil rights movement. We'll talk about discovering we have poor people in America. We'll talk about the drug scene, and we go on down the list. And then I ask a question. How effectively did the Church of Jesus Christ respond to the happening 60s, 70s, and 80s? And invariably the response is not very well. And one of the reasons we didn't do very well was we didn't expect the world to change. I am an older guy who can remember the 50s. And I think those of us who were alive back then expected the 50s to kind of be the story from now on. It isn't. All of a sudden we hit the vortex of change called the 60s and now we're moving into a world with escalating change. We can no longer do planning in our churches as though the future is going to be more of the present. Virtually everything we do in Christian mission organizations, urban and international, is to plan like we're frozen in a time warp, as though the future is going to be more of what's happening now. There are a few Christian organizations that are trying to look down the trail and a few churches, and I'll tell you a couple stories, because we need to plan with foresight. What it looks like is, is Presbyterian Church out in Southern California. I said, draw a circle around your community, and they did, the community that they minister in. I said, now tell me one group that's going to be moving into the community and growing numbers in the next 10 years. And they said, oh, we're going to have an absolute explosion of single parent moms. So I asked them, and I asked you, what are the special needs of single parent moms? Child care, economic, emotional support. They've got 10 years to get ready. They don't have to wait. You know, they don't have to wait. And what we've tended to do is wait until problems are blowing up on our doorstep. Many, many churches need to look at their, their giving patterns. How many of you are Presbyterians or American Baptists here? Presbyterians? Presbyterians, many of your churches are graying. You need to look not only how your community is going to be different in 10 years, you need to look at who's giving by age if you're in a graying church and look at when you're going to be in crisis. Mm -hmm. My parents' Baptist church went out of, nearly went out of business in five years from being a very affluent church to a church that couldn't even pay the pastor's salary. We need to lead with foresight. What it looks like in terms of urban ministry and international ministry is working, we worked with a group called Tier Fund England. They're like World Vision, and they're one of the few groups that does something corporations routinely do called uh, uh, contextual forecasting. They ask the question, the context in which they minister, and they do urban ministry in Britain, but they also work in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So they said, how are the cities in which we do ministry going to change in the next 10 years in Britain? They said, how is Africa going to be, be different? What are going to be the new needs and challenges? Do you understand the value of doing that? And doing that kind of looking at how demographics are changing, the new needs, then again, they have lead time to be proactive instead of reactive. This last year, we've done scenario forecasting with them. Scenario forecasting is something that corporations use a lot, where you write two, three, four stories about the future, and you don't bet the farm that any one of them is going to be right. And then you play through those stories. And we looked at a boom time in Britain in terms of urban ministry, and we looked at it really falling into the, you know, into the garbage can in terms of the economy and saying, now, what would that mean for the urban poor you work with? We're going to do just a bit of that this morning. But let me ask you, how many of you are involved in raising kids, parents, grandparents, or youth ministry people? Parents, grandparents, or youth ministry. You know what? We need, to, we need a wake-up call because I think unconsciously we're raising our kids to live in the world that we grew up in instead of the third millennium. And we're doing much of the wrong thing in, in, in American white Christian homes. I can tell you we're doing most of the wrong things. Our young people are going to be growing up and graduating into a world that is going to be much more high demanding, where they're going to have to be self-starters, high initiators and problem solvers, and the parenting styles are protective and indulging, doing for the young. We need to give our young people much more responsibility much earlier, and we need to get them ready to live in a blended America where it's going to be a, a, a wonderful rainbow of colors. We need to get them ready for a world that's going to be much more challenging challenging and where it's going to be much tougher for them economically. So in all kinds of ways we need to get ready for the future and Wayne I have a suggestion uh, for CCDA of actually developing a futures watch group 
on the internet where you start collecting trends both about the changing needs and demographics of poverty in America and how the cities are changing the different government programs and different creative ministries that are being you know that are emerging to address those we really need leaders who lead with foresight so what I want to do now is take you on some trips back to the future I want to sketch for you my quick contextual forecast of some of the changes that are coming and I'm going to take you to different cities and then I would urge you to keep a list because at the end I'm going to ask you right where you're sitting with people right next to you to talk about where are the opportunities and implications. Now let me just tell you right up front, many of these are very challenging. Some of them are overwhelming, but they are all opportunities for the people of God in the name of Jesus Christ to find creative ways to make a difference. So we're going to start in Washington, D.C. I was in Washington, D.C. and heard about a book that had just been written at a meeting in Washington when my ceasefire book came out uh, called Jihad versus McWorld. Now, McWorld stands for McDonald's, and McDonald's has just passed up Coke as the number one most recognized logo in the world. One of the things that futurists do is to try to pay attention not only to change, but what are the driving forces for change. And one of the major driving forces for change right now is economic globalization. Now, let me explain what's happened. With the end of the Cold War, with the end of the Cold War, all of the centrally planned economies of the world were thrown in the trash bin of history. They don't work very well. Free market, uh, uh, free market systems work much better. Everybody has joined the global race to the top. In the last 10 years, we've girded the planet in a global electronic nervous system, satellite dishes and fax machines, and through that global system, $1.3 trillion circulates around the world every day. There are a lot of folks into end time stuff which is not something that I'm as interested in they're concerned about one world government I don't think that is a prayer of happening but we're already a part of a one world economic order and you need to wake up to the fact the way it's going to impact your lives your urban ministries it's going to impact the poor it's going to impact the middle class and we need to start understanding the implications of this because there's an upside and there's a downside the upside is that we've been experiencing the last seven years the longest his uh, the longest economic boom in my life time of sustained economic growth and the upside of that is that a lot more people have jobs there's a lot more resource for people doing urban ministry but I have to tell you the truth while many of us that are middle class have seen some of our incomes go up our giving patterns have not kept pace with the rate at which our incomes are going up we've got some real problems there the other problem if this long boom continues and some economists are betting that we're not going to hit a recession and we're going to regain we're not going to be a part of the global meltdown they may be right but I can tell you there's a downside to on ongoing continuous economic growth and I see it in Seattle near Microsoft is pe people are becoming idolatrous in their consumerism they're not trusting God they're moving into a kind of materialism at a level that's unprecedented at least in my lifetime and we need to get people already of the dangers of that now the downside is there's every possibility that we could enter another recession fairly soon if Brazil goes into the tank, if Japan's banking system doesn't follow through on the reform, we could all be into a major recession. And who would be the folks that would be hurt most in this country? Who would, the poor. The poor would be devastated because they don't have the margins and they don't have the assets. They're only one paycheck away from desperate and hard times. And we need to get ready for that because whether it comes today or tomorrow, we need people in urban ministries help people buffer themselves and develop some kind of reserve. You've heard about the Y2K bug, the millennium bug. Now, I don't want to feed the kind of hysteria and kind of feeding frenzy that some of the end times people are into in some of the survival movements. But we have to take it seriously. I don't know if you've heard, but InterVarsity Christian Fellowship has just postponed their Urbana that was going to happen during that time because of the risk of flying 20,000 young people from all over the country. We know an earthquake is coming. And those of you involved in urban ministry need to get ready. You need to find some contingency plans so that you are ready for worst case scenario if that comes into being. Not so that we can be survivalists, but so that we have enough resource to address the urgent needs of people if that comes. So we need to be ready for good times and bad times. And we need to be ready because a recession will be coming sooner or later. 
And I suspect unless we see the economy turned around in some other parts of the world, it's going to be sooner. Part of what we've done in creating this global economy is we are all much more tightly linked together. 60 years ago, if Japan had had trouble, it wouldn't make any difference. But we're going to be living in a world from now on where we're going to be a lot more vulnerable. We're going to see some boom times, but it could come unglued very rapidly. So we need to create urban ministries to help people uh, buffer those times and get ready for the good and the difficult. Now, we're going to take a next trip to Lake Victoria. Lake Victoria is, uh, we're in Uganda, on the Uganda side of the lake, and there's this dear family with uh, uh, four kids, and they have just a kind of a hand-to-mouth existence. They were able, until six years ago, to buy fish two days a week so they could have a little protein in their diet. Well, part of globalization, part of what makes it possible, there are two engines to globalization, free enterprise and free trade. And free trade means everybody can kind of shop and everybody can fish in everybody else's pond. Well, what's happened is the Europeans that have fished out their lakes discovered Lake Victoria. They've built fishing, uh, fish processing plants on the edge of Lake Victoria. The African fishermen are selling them the fish for the lake and they're taking out 200 ton tons a week to consumers up, up in Europe who are perfectly happy to pay that price. The price has gone up four times so that this family that lives on the edge of the lake can't buy fish from their own lake anymore. They have to go to the fish factory and buy the bones so that they can get a little bit of something in their diet besides just rice and vegetables. One of the downsides of economic globalization is that it doesn't always work for the people without, well, for people without assets. One of the things, I've worked in Haiti for seven years. One of the, take you to Haiti quickly. You, you, you folks know about all the chicken McNuggets and you know that Americans particularly love chicken white meat. Do you know what that's done? It's created this huge surplus of chicken legs. And so what they've been do doing is dumping chicken legs on the markets of countries like Haiti, driving poultry farmers out of business because poultry farmers can't raise chicken as cheap as we can dump our chicken legs from America. So in an interdependent, interconnected world, it's not always going to work well for the people without assets and people on the edge and the people in problem. I need to tell you because normally Christine and I work together on this and she would tell you the global population. While it's slowing, we're still in desperate times. The population in Africa is, Africa is going to double by the year 2020. There's been going to be growing needs of poor abroad and we're going to be talking about partnership in these days and we need, we need black and Hispanic churches and white churches to partner with sisters and brothers in Africa, Asia, Latin America to help those people buffer themselves to get ready for the good times and the hard times. We need to encourage the growth. We need the jobs. But we need to find ways to do it so that it doesn't eat us alive with some of the materialism. Now I want to take you on another trip to Chicago because we're not only seeing a widening gap between rich and poor globally, but one child in five in America is born in poverty. The numbers of poor families, working poor families, is increasing in America in spite of the economy. I celebrate the fact that folks are coming off welfare and the opportunity for Christians to be involved now. I think that's great, but I have to tell you, I'm not keen on the way we've set this up because it isn't working well for a lot of poor folks. I want to tell you about Tracy in Chicago. Tracy was on trial three years ago and was convicted for drug, drug abuse. She was put in a Christian center that the Jesus People USA folks work with and there Carol started working with Tracy. Tracy got her life together. She recommitted her life to Christ. The court awarded her three years later her three kids back that were in foster care. She got her GED passed. She had the support of her church and she was ready to move forward. But the only job she was able to get with her GED equivalency was $70 an hour in Chicago. And once she bought rent and food, she had no money left for health. She had no money left for child care. And we're moving into a future in which we're going to be getting some folks off welfare, but not at a level they're going to be able to sustain themselves. So one of the things the church needs to do is we need to start doing some serious job training for jobs that pay $10, $12 an hour or more, because the entry-level jobs aren't going to cook and they're not going to do it. Uh, I, I don't think that either Republicans or Democrats are willing to do real welfare reform, which means spending more money now to help people get a decent income so that they never have to come back and be a part of that working poor. So we need to do much more. Now, from Chicago, I want to take you to Fresno. H. Spees, you used to live in Fresno. Are you still there, H? Work. Okay. Well, Fresno, when I worked in a Baptist church uh, about five years ago, White Baptist Church, they were in denial. 
Because when I grew up in San Francisco, Fresno was essentially a white community. Fresno is no longer a white community. Fresno is a richly blended community, and I found a lot of the folks that I was working with this white Baptist church were in denial. They weren't about to accept the fact that they lived in a, in a truly blended community. Well, my friends, we need to get ready for a blended future. The United States of America is going to be the first country on earth to become a first truly universal nation. 2060, the major population group will be, be, be those of you from Hispanic background, African American, Anglo, and we need those of us from white background to stop and think about it. For years, we've assumed that the best thing you can do for your kids, if you care about them, is to raise them in the all-white, upper-middle-class suburban communities. The last place to be raising kids that are going to live in the 21st uh, century is in all-white communities. Amen. We need to start celebrating the gifts we bring one another from our African-American, our Hispanic, our Asian, our Anglo background. We need to start becoming the body of Christ. And my friends, we were awful late on the civil rights issue. Most of our Christian magazines, white Christian magazines, other than Sojourners, was not in touch with the civil rights movement belatedly through uh, promise keepers we're starting to discover the issue of racial reconciliation but we need to start getting ready and really be involved in one another's lives getting ready for a richly celebrated blended future for the 21st century and that needs to affect where we raise kids and the kinds of things that we do together as sisters and brothers next trip is to Phoenix one of the things that uh, I find a fluid white Christians do and I don't understand it is they leave wherever they've lived for 40 years and move to Phoenix when they get old <laughs> makes no sense to me at all. We're moving into a future of the graying of not only America, but we're moving into a future of the graying of many parts of the world, Japan, throughout Europe, and there's a group in this room called Baby Boomers, born between 46 and 64. 77 million, you guys. Boomers, raise your hands. Look at that, room full of boomers. Demographers describe you guys as a pig passing through a python. Can you get in touch with that imagery? <laughs> Do you know the most terrifying word in the boomer vocabulary? Most terrifying word? Bifocal. Bifocal. Boomers live in terror of that word bifocal. When boomers, when boomers roll over demographically, those of us on either side are going to get crunched. And my folks, we're headed for we're headed for a big wave. 2010, all you boomers start hitting the nursing homes. What happens when 77 million boomers all hit the nursing homes at the same time? We're going to see a tremendous crisis between 2010 and 2030. They're going to take their money out of the stock market, take their kids to Disneyland. They're going to take their money out of Christian giving because they're retired. You need to get ready for a downturn in economic support unless you can find some way to include those folk, get those folks to include you in your will. But the, but the other thing you need to realize, with the graying of America, you've got a whole new range of volunteers. And you need to really target the seniors and bring them on board. They're the new volunteer corps for the third millennium. Well, now, against this backdrop of growing needs overseas and at home, let me tell you something else about McWorld. All of the Western countries, Australia, New Zealand, Great Britain, Sweden, the United States, everybody, everybody wants to be as competitive as possible in this global economic race to the top. So what they're doing is cutting back all their social programs to the poor, both overseas and in our own countries. So we're moving into a future in this brutally competitive race to the top where social benefit programs to the poor are being cut, which means we need to get ready for the church to do more. You're going to have to do more overseas and at home to address the needs because the government is slowly going to get out of it. It isn't just an American phenomenon, though our cutback program is the most significant. And so we're going to have to do more. I've got bad news for you. McWorld is also bringing pressure on programs to cut back programs to the middle class. And so more and more middle class folks are going to have to take take responsibility for more of their own pension and more of their own, you know, other needs in their lives where government programs have been available. And young people particularly are going to be hit as this, this begins to change. Well, let me take you to Seattle where Christine and I live. In Seattle, we've been a part of that long boom. And we see some Microsoft millionaires that are doing very well. We went to the Seattle Home Show, and they must have had 80 hot tub displays there. I mean, people are buying hot tubs. I think they're buying three and four for their homes. I don't understand it. But the level of affluence is unbelievable. But what we find is we work with people in Seattle and Los Angeles and Denver and everywhere else is middle class people are now having to work harder and longer just to stay even. Do you know anybody like that? Uh -huh. Having to work harder and longer just to stay even? Because in this competitive global economy, they're going to be putting more 
more and more pressure on you to work harder and work longer. They're also going to put more and more pressure on you to consume more because the only way to kind of get this economy growing at this rate and keep the tempo up is to really encourage us all to become super consumers at a level we have never ever consumed that before and I'm not sure that is necessarily good news. My particular, can I just point out that means that there's going to be less money as we and less time as middle class people get busier and busier. We're going to have less time to volunteer and less money to give if we get caught up in the seductions of all of that consumerism and so we need to kind of wake up to what that means. But how many of you are under 35? Under 35 people, raise your hands. Can I tell you, first of all, you're the gift of the kingdom. You are the leaders for the 21st century. Every place that Christine and I work, overseas and at home, we find a new generation of under 35 that God is raising up to lead the church in the 21st century. I applaud you guys. I applaud you. You are the future of the church. But the problem is you're hitting the economy at a really rough time. How many of you have some college debt? How many are running, working with college debt? When I graduated college, Don's got some college debt. When I graduated college, debt was unheard of. The relationship of what you earn to what you buy has changed. I went to a small Christian college, graduated in 58. The total cost, room, board, tuition, fees, and books was 700 year, a year. 700 a year. That's true. Everything. I worked as a janitor. I worked as a janitor at $4 an hour in the San Francisco Bay Area and had no trouble paying that in the summer, making it a job. Today, that package has gone up more than 20 times. Seattle Pacific, up where we are, is 20,000 a year for the whole package. And young people are graduating. I was at Biola, and young people came up with 20 to $60,000 debt loads. Those young people are having to put off being involved in urban ministry or anything else to make a difference for at least a decade. Christine and I teach courses for Fuller Theological Seminary. My students told me the other night, says there's no way I can go full time because if I go full time, I will have such a big debt load that I'll never find a church that will may pay me enough to help me pay off the debt load. So we need a wake-up call because we've got a serious, serious problem, sisters and brothers. And the number one problem is housing. Now, Don works with housing for the poor, and we were talking on the way in from the airport. I'm concerned for housing for the middle class because young people are, are buying houses. They're trying to live out their parents' lifestyle, yep. and over half their income is going into rent or mortgage. Yep. And they're not going to begin to have the time or money left because they're, they're, many of them are getting jobs. They're getting jobs that will not hardly pay a living wage after they're college graduates and they're struggling with the same thing that a lot of work, working poor are. So we need a wake-up call as to what that means. The next trip I want to take you on is to Abbotsford, British Columbia. This is the meeting of the World Evangelical Fellowship. It's one of the great international Christian organizations. If you don't know it, you need to. And we were there talking about my world and globalization. I had two Pentecostal pastors come up to me and give me some bad news. And I said, what's the problem? He said, we've lost all of our young people. I said, uh, where do you work? He says, the Dominican Republic. He says, in the last five years, we've lost all of our young people. I said, what, what's happened? He said, MTV. He said, five years ago, MTV came in, and all of the appeals of American entertainment and media has just drawn our young people away. Let me sketch out where we're at here. We're going backwards, not forwards, in world evangelization. In spite of the AD 2000 movement, there are a lot more short-term missions. There are a lot of parachurch groups doing all kinds of good things overseas. But population growth is outstripping our best efforts. Today, 28% of the world's people identify themselves as some kind of Christian, Protestant, Catholic, or Orthodox. But because population growth is growing more rapidly than the church is growing, by the year 2010, it's going to be 27% and continue to decline from there. We're not getting the job done. We've got more to do overseas and more at home, but our real competitors aren't the Muslims. Yeah. The real competitors are Macworld. Yeah. Because Macworld is just celebrating in marketing magazines now, for the first time in the history of the world, they've created a borderless youth, youth market where they can sell their Nikes, they can sell their Adidas, they can sell American TV and American MTV like they're doing in the Dominican Republic all over the world. And young people are cutting connections with traditional cultures, they're cutting connections with their church, and they're becoming a part of a global youth superculture that is, des that is, that is being programmed to consume and buy, and it isn't just buying, it is requiring those young people to change their values so that they will all watch the same videos and drink the same soda pop. And we've got some work to do because those same influences are in our cities, they're, they're influencing our young, whether they're poor or middle class, and we've got some major work to do. Well, our next trip is to, Wash, uh, is to New York City. My wife and I were attending a, an Episcopal church, and we couldn't figure out what was strange, but as we left, we figured out what was strange. 
Everybody there was over 65 years of age. It was like worshiping in a geriatric ward. <laughs> this is a metaphor for the future. The whole Western church in Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Great Britain, Canada, the United States is graying and declining. Now there's growth among black and Hispanic churches. Thank God for that. The American Baptist, the black and Hispanic side of the church is growing, but the white side is declining. And what we're moving into is a future in which we're going to need to do more in the cities of America and the needy spots of the world. We're going to need to do much more in global evangelism. But the Western church is the incredibly shrinking church. Old line, mainline denominations are growing, and the growth among evangelical, charismatic, Willow, Willow Creek kind of churches is not enough to offset the trend. And the missing generation in all of our churches is the under 35. In all of our churches, there is a, I'm talking nationally now, there are churches where you have a lot of young people, but nationally, the under 35 are the underrepresented group. There are going to be fewer of them as we go into the third millennium. And they're not going to begin to fund the church and its mission into the cities in the style to which we become accustomed because my generation sold their generation the wrong dream. For all the talk about the Lordship of Jesus, my generation sold the under 35, the American dream with a little Jesus overlay. Yeah. For all the talk about Lordship of Jesus, the real message to Christian Young is Agenda 1's getting that career underway. Agenda 1's getting that house in the suburbs. Agenda 1's getting my upscale lifestyle started, and then with whatever I have left over, I follow Jesus. Because the costs have changed. If the young people, the Christian young people here and throughout our churches try to live out their parents' lifestyle, they're not going to begin to have the time or money to fund your ministries, your churches in the next millennium. They're not even going to be able to make it to church on a regular basis because of the, the attempt to try to get up that mountain and pursue a dream that is not the biblical dream. So what do we do? Well, what we do and my, my suggestions for how we begin to deal with change, and then I'm going to invite you to think about what we do, is we need to pray for discernment because we're in a time of change. But we also need people, we need leaders who lead with foresight and start to read and analyze what this means for the folks you work with. We also need those of you that are working with the poor to develop some reserves and some buffers, help people to become much more self-reliant, growing more of their own food, and not only getting jobs, but developing some asset base and developing some resources, the kind of things that John Perkins has talked about in other days. For those of us that are middle class, we need to really think about what it means to follow Jesus in a changing world. We need to ask seriously, to what extent are we giving our lives to the agendas of culture, and the American dream, and to what extent are we following Christ? And we need to help young people, before they get locked into all the consumer stuff, really discover what their ministry vocation is, how to put first things first. We need a new generation that leads the church, and we need to help them do that. We're going to cre need to create partnerships, the kind of thing that Don is doing with different groups that he shared this morning. Uh, last night, one of the pastors, uh, Michael Jones, shared his partnering. Uh, I heard a Methodist church was partnering with an urban church. The Methodist church was out in the rural areas. They were growing fruit trees to plant in the parking strips in the inner city areas. We need all kinds of partnerships. The call for renewal is represented here, bringing together black, Hispanic, Asian churches, Anglo churches, mainline, Catholic, to find some ways to work cooperatively in the city together. We need to become Christian, creative Christian scroungers, doing much more with much less. Working in an urban ministry conference in Chicago, I said, find something that's thrown away in the city and do something for the kingdom. Uh, they came back a little while later and I said, what have you got for us? And they said, old tires. And I said, what are you talking about? They said, we're going to stack, we're going to collect old tires, Chicago, Detroit, St. Louis. We're going to stack those tires nine tires high, fill the tires with dirt, the dirt with potato seed. You water it from the top. The potato sprouts come out between the tires. When it's harvest time, you push over the tires, you pick up the potatoes and sweep up the dirt. I said, you're kidding. They said, no, it's called vertical gardening. It will work. We're going to need ways wow. to help people become much more creative in using underutilized resources. And at the center of all of this, we need to rediscover that God has a different dream than the American dream. Yeah. We need to go back to the Bible, and we need to go to the vision of Isaiah. God has a vision of a new heaven, a new earth, a new mountain, new city, a people coming Coming home to justice, righteousness, hope, and the shalom of God. It's a different dream than the American dream. Tomorrow we're going to talk about that dream and talk about creative ways to put that dream at the center of our lives instead of the American dream where little Jesus worked in around the edge. What I want you to do right now is to turn to somebody next to you and say, where are the opportunities where I work and do urban ministry? What are the opportunities for the kids that I'm working with? What are the opportunities for my own life, lifestyle? 
and my own life priorities. How can we buffer the poor against the changes that are coming? So everybody talk to somebody. There's good people here. Let's talk to one another. have Don and Jarvis share just three ideas they came up with. We don't have time for everyone to share. Continue this conversation over lunch. I might just say this is coming out of a book that I'm hoping to finish, I have to finish in the next two weeks called uh, Mustard Seed versus McWorld, Reinventing Christian Life and Mission for the Third Millennium with Baker Books. So, And our other books are out on the, on the table. Uh, the one gets after the need. I think God's bigger than Republicans and Democrats. As we work internationally, as we work internationally, nowhere else in the world do you find the church polarized politically between left and right. Only in America. And nowhere else do you have to be a conservative Republican supporting the gun lobby to be born again Christian. This is only in America. So, uh, uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to look at that. Uh, but I want these two dear brothers to share three creative ideas they came up with to respond to the challenges of a new millennium. Don and Jarvis, here we go. We're doing this together. Okay. Partnership has already been formed. Thank you. You go first. No, you go first. Okay. <laughs> One of the things that we talked about is that there's a rich history and tradition in the African American church for music. We saw that with Friendly Temple. And that one of the ways that we can start countering some of the urban dynamic is by sponsoring urban choirs that are Christian oriented to give our young people a way to express themselves. We see that going on in some dynamics and we should support that. The other piece to that is that we have a tremendous need to, res to see community and family restored. And part of that to be very, very specific about healing relationships within the urban community and being very deliberate about bringing back and restoring marriages and families and parent-children relationships. We have to see that. We have to be a part of restoring relationships. The third one. The third one we talked about is that we need to be deliberate and intentional in forging urban-suburban partnerships among churches. Yes. And part of that partnership is that we have to be very, very deliberate about defining what that will be. Right. Clear about the strategy and very clear about the tactics. We won't be able to reach our cities right. without real clearly defined partnerships. It's not just celebratory worship. It's specific ministries, resource sharing, wealth redistribution that we're talking about. Amen. Let's give a hand. My sisters and brothers, we're at the threshold of a new millennium. We're not here by accident. God has invited us to be with the church as we cross the threshold. All of the challenges of tomorrow's world for us followers of Jesus Christ are opportunities. I send you forth to create to imagine and to dream new ways that God can use our lives and mustard seeds to be a part of his compassionate response to the growing issues of the third millennium. Can we bow in prayer? Creator God, in the name of the resurrected Christ, we are here as sisters and brothers together from many backgrounds and traditions, thanking you for what you're doing in the cities of America and the lives of people. But we also thank you for the opportunities of the future. Dear God, help us blow through our imaginations and help us imagine new ways to seek first your purposes in response to the urgent challenges of tomorrow's world. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.